Good afternoon and welcome to this round table on Ethiopia, the Tigray crisis and the international community. My name is Giovanni Carbone, I'm head of the Africa program at ISPI uh, and I'm glad to welcome our three panelists today. They are Alex Deval, Executive Director of World Peace Foundation and Professor at Tufts University, Theodore Murphy, Director uh, of the Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations, Mutoni Wanieki, Regional Director for Africa at Open Society Foundations. Uh, fourth panelist, Zainab Uzman, was unfortunately unable to uh, join us as planned. So thank you all for accepting our uh, invitation. We shall hear from our panelists for, for about 45 uh, minutes and then we shall open the floor to questions from the audience. So uh, you can please send them uh, via the, the, they told me the reserved area. I'm not sure what exactly I this is, but uh, sh you should be able to, uh, to see that uh, on your um, monitors. Um, so just a few words by way of introduction. Over the recent years, Ethiopia has been uh, internationally acclaimed uh, by virtue of uh, its impressive economic growth and advances in reducing uh, poverty. Then back in November, what was originally a political clash between the federal government and the regional uh, authority uh, in Tigray led to armed conflict. This was a political crisis that, that turned uh, armed conflict uh, and turn humanitarian crisis. Media and humanitarian access to Tigray has been hindered by uh, the federal government, yet there is growing evidence of widespread violence and devastation, mass killings, ethnic cleansing, systematic sexual violence, rising food insecurity. International calls have been made for an end to hostilities, humanitarian and media access and peace talks. Uh, most of this has been largely rejected by Addis Ababa, which claims that its actions amount to uh, a law enforcement operation that is uh, a domestic issue. The UN Security Council is divided. Uh, plenty of international envoys uh, to Ethiopia or to the Horn have been appointed uh, by the UN, by the US, by the EU, by the AU, uh, but with uh, little progress. So, why is this? Uh, what should and what can be done? Um, I would like to start with uh, Mutoni Wanieki. As I said, uh, she's Regional Director for Africa of the Open Society Foundations. Uh, Mutoni, um, how is the situation on the ground evolving in Tigray um, in terms of both the conflict on the one hand and the humanitarian crisis on the other? Mutoni, please. So, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. I mean, obviously, it's pretty hard to get very clear statistics on deaths, on destruction of property, and so on and so forth. One, uh, but overall, I mean, what was touted as a quote unquote law enforcement operation in November with very clear and specific sort of aims to arrest about 170 some leaders, political leaders and military leaders, businessmen um, who supported the TPLF has uh, quickly morphed as anticipated and as predicted uh, by many commentators inside and outside Ethiopia into what can only be termed now a regional, regionalized internal conflict. Um, one database that sort of keeps statistics um, estimates that there have been over 5,300 fatalities from about two 724 armed um, hostilities. Um, but like I say, that's pretty hard to estimate. Um, the UNHCR, um, from the sites that they can access in their most recent report, um, show that uh, about 1 million people have been displaced in Tigray from sites that IOM could access as of mid-April. About 63,000 uh, 63, uh, Ethiopians are now refugees in the Sudan. Um, and of course, there have been dislocation of the pre-existing caseload of Eritrean refugees who were hosted in Tigray. Um, in terms of sort of the initial demands for media access, for human rights access, for humanitarian access, it would be unfair to say that the government has not sort of taken some steps or made some concessions. But as you know, despite the fact that their uh, administration for refugee and returning affairs is 
working with IOM, the UNHCR relief organizations, to meet needs, the relief community continues to complain about lack of access due to bureaucratic hurdles, the inability to access all parts of Tigai due to security concerns. The conflict is ongoing. Uh, we're going on seven months now. Services remain highly spotty. Um, electricity, banking, intermittent, affecting cash transfer programs that you know had, Ethiopia had been a model for. Um, education, health services, and many public institutions have been destroyed. So that's pretty patchy as well, except where the relief community has had access to. Lots of reports about malnutrition, not just due to the locust infestation last year, but because of the conflict, pillage of agricultural um, equipment, of seeds, of harvest, and so on by some of the combatants there. Um, so it's not a good situation. Um, and we're looking really at over 25 years of development investments having been erased, including universities, as well as reports of severe destruction of cultural heritage. Um, what this means sort of at the macro level is World Bank estimates of GDP growth in 9 of 9% in 2019 went down to 6.1 in uh, last year and may hit around zero this year. And of course, that's partly COVID, but it's also impacts of this regionalized armed conflict. Thank you, Muthoni. Uh, against this background, there have been uh, uh, repeated international calls for action. There is an implicit assumption in the title of um, our roundtable, and I'd, I'd like to pose a question uh, to, to Alex on this. Uh, an implicit assumption that the international community should do something about Tigray, but sovereign governments are normally supposed to react um, autonomously to armed challenges within their national borders. This is what a government in, in Italy, in Germany, or in the US would normally do. Why shouldn't we simply leave Ethiopia, sort out a conflict that takes place within uh, its own sovereign national territory uh, on its own? Is the Ethiopian case different? And if so, why? Alex, please. Thank you. Well, the first thing I, I just want to say is I've been working for 37 years as a researcher and a professional on the issue of war and famine. And this is the worst situation um, we've seen in that period, um, probably anywhere in the world. We are back to a type of warfare, a type of famine that we hoped had been consigned to history. Um, I would fully expect that in the next week or two weeks, the, the UN, and if it fails to do so, the US would declare that this is, that this is a famine. Um, and and uh, according to UN Security Council Resolution 2417, that brings it to the attention of the, the, the UN Security Council implicitly as a threat to international peace and security. But the broader point is that um, some 25 years ago, in response to egregious violations in Africa, um, including in, in, in Ethiopia itself, the deliberate campaigns of starvation war waged by the former military government, um, the genocide in, in, in Rwanda, the, the, the coup in Sierra Leone, and a whole host of other um, unconscionable atrocities. The African leaders realized that the old doctrine of sovereignty as impunity, you can do what you like behind the cloak of sovereignty, was no longer good for purpose. And actually, it was dragging down the entire continent. And a group of African scholars and diplomats and activists developed a whole set of doctrines, beginning with the idea of sovereignty as responsibility. That was the brainchild of Francis Deng, the Sudanese scholar and, and diplomat. And then in the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide, the principle of non-indifference was developed by the Africans, by the, 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 the OAU, the principle of not tolerating military coups. And, is, and then with the new Partnership for Africa's development, the idea that Africans should assess one another um, uh, governance capability precisely in order that there shouldn't be intervention by external powers, that Africa's African solutions meant Africa's 
Africans actually resolving these problems, not pretending to resolve them, not sending others away and saying, this is our business, saying we will genuinely get to grips with that. And so the Constitutive Act of the African Union has a whole host of measures, including this principle of non-indifference, where there are war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide, the other African states are obliged to act. And there is a, a standing practice of an obligation to mediate, to resolve wars in one country, and an obligation to accept mediation. Now, what happened in, 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 in the case of Ethiopia was the African Union did respond, albeit in a fairly half-hearted way, and was rebuffed. And the, the current prime minister of, of Ethiopia, Abi Ahmed, actually wrote an article in, in Project Syndicate, an, an online newspaper, talking about his vision for peace. And he published it on the day, first day of the African Union summit back in February. And in that article, he did not once mention the norms, principles, and institutions that the Africans had developed over the previous 25 years for addressing exactly this sort of conflict. Basically, he said, none of your business. He was going back to the bad old days of the 70s and 80s. And it is an international threat. It's a threat to international peace and security, not least because the major protagonist in the war is the Eritreans. Three quarters of the fighting is done by the Eritreans. The Ethiopian forces that remain in Tigray are under the command of the Eritreans. It is essentially an Eritrea versus Tigray war. Currently, it's about at a condition of approximately parity. The Tigray defense forces, led by veterans from the 70s and 80s, who actually know how to mold a guerrilla force while fighting, have remobilized themselves. These were not among those who were fing fingered as members of the TPLF, the so-called criminal junta, back last year. These are the people who had retired from politics. They've come back. They are leading this force. They have, in the last uh, battles, in, in, in the last few weeks, they saw off an offensive of 25 Eritrean divisions and seven Ethiopian divisions. Um, with battlefield fatalities numbering in the thousands. And they're approximately parity. According to data I received this morning, there are about 1.6 million people in the areas controlled and administered by the Tigray Defence Forces. So under any, pretty much any definition of, of a threat to international peace and security, what we see is Ethiopia at the point of of, of collapsing as a coherent entity, Eritrea closely involved, and a major war with enormous humanitarian and human rights implications, with, uh, which is not just a major humanitarian issue, but a major peace and security issue. Um, and this is being conducted in absolute clear defiance of the fundamental principles that the African Union itself developed for managing such crises. So the, um, this is not a, a, a matter behind which the Ethiopian government can hide and say, oh, this is our, um, our, our sovereign business, keep away. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so to the extent that this is a, 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 an international issue, and you argued very strongly about this, the broader international community has been, um, it's not been exactly united uh, in, in deciding what kind of positions and what kind of initiatives it might take uh, with regard to the Tigray crisis. What kind of divisions have emerged um, and what are their implications? Theo, can you, can you tell us something about this? Theo? Sure, sure, happy to do so. I think, it's, I think it's useful to think about this in terms of two phases. We have the, the early phase when the conflict broke out. Recording and then, in progress. And then, um, and then the second phase now, uh, where we find ourselves. The differences in the first phase uh, emerged around the framing, I would say. There was a strong view that Tigray was something of a, of a distraction to the wider plans and ambitions that Abiy Ahmed had announced and that much of the international community wholeheartedly supported for realizing a transformation of Ethiopia to something more liberal, more stable, continually developing. And Tigray was standing in the way of that. It had to be dealt with. Uh, it was unavoidable. But 
not to worry. The bigger objective and the plan was still on track. So that colored very much the initial stance, I would say, uh, in Europe. That was a very dominant narrative. And the consequence of it was that there was not very consequential uh, action from Europe. There was, in one way or another, a feeling that uh, the Ethiopian government needed its space to deal with this, this troublesome problem. We're, we're in a more clear-eyed place now, I would say. There's, uh, there's a realization that you know, Tigray is not derivative, uh, derivative or subsidiary to Ethiopia's development, that what's going on there is, um, you know, is, is of paramount importance and the humanitarian tragedy um, is, is on a scale, as Alex previously described, that's almost unthinkable. Something I think uh, Prime Minister Hamdok of Sudan quite accurately said in some senses, this is, this is Ethiopia's Darfur. And Sudanese know what they're talking about. So the difference that we have now is not so much um, how important is Tigray and what is happening there. The difference we have now is how do we approach it? And this approach is important. There is a school of thought that says uh, pressure doesn't work in Ethiopia. And the consequence of that approach is that one should continue to use persuasion and give opportunities for the Ethiopian government, but also other actors to make good choices, to make the right choices. And one should try to reward those. Uh, the, recent, the recent thinking of extending an election observation mission to Ethiopia is, is a good example of that. It was trying to show that if they did the right thing in Ethiopia, uh, Europe and others would be there to, to meet them halfway. Now there's a second approach which, which says, um, no, it's, it's clear by now after all this time, we've been watching this long enough to see that a more radical change in the calculation of the Ethiopian government is necessary. And that persuasion alone, um, rewarding good, good, unquote, behavior alone is not gonna work. Something needs, there needs to be something more dramatic and more confrontational. And I think this is a good way to characterize uh, the new U.S. approach. And we will probably have a question of where Europe and the U.S. meet up here. So the question won't be in terms of our analysis of the situation in the transatlantic way. The, the question will be about the approach. Can we find a transatlantic approach? Common one. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Um, Alex, let me get back to you. Uh, the World Peace Foundation, of which you are the director, is stressing uh, that the food insecurity side of the crisis. What kind of evidence were you able to collect, and how is the situation evolving from that point of view? I mean, we, we have heard mm. s some information on that, but can you elaborate on it? There are various sorts of information, and as Muthoni mentioned, um, formal uh, access for uh, those who, 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 who assess food security and for journalists has been extraordinarily difficult. In fact, over most parts of Tigray, there's really no access, and access has actually tightened up. Um, uh, some weeks ago, the Ethiopian government declared the, the, the TPLF a terrorist organization, which led to an immediate construction of, 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 of where assistance was possible and where reporting was possible. What we did was we used the, the analysis of how the food economy worked, which is used the standard analysis, which is used by um, international agencies, the UN and, 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 and USAID and, and, and so on, which had already indicated that the food security situation in Tigray had deteriorated from normal stress, which is sort of phase one and two of, of, of the scale, to phase four, which is emergency. There is phase five is, is famine. Now, to get into phase five famine, certain indicators need to pass certain thresholds. The nutrition indicator has passed that threshold. There's no question that few nutrition surveys that there are consistently show levels of child nutrition that are in the famine range. The food security analysis of actually the food that is available 
hasn't been done, but everything that we hear, comprehensive reporting, indicates that the starvation crimes, the deliberate destruction of what is required to sustain life, has been done on such a scale that the, the food economy has massively contracted. And as for mortality, we are still reliant on anecdotes. And there is a, currently a survey going on. And I heard one extraordinarily um, disturbing piece of evidence from the survey that has been done by the Ethiopians themselves, which was that in a particular part of Tigray, where they had reached people, more than half of the families whom they spoke to had lost a child to hunger and disease over the last six months. Now, the, where we have the deliberate suppression of information and the deliberate distortion of data, which is what we have in, by the Ethiopian government at the moment, the, our standard systems break down. But everything we know about how these food systems work, you know, decades of experience with how famines unfold, tell us this is a famine, and um, it is unavoidable for us to um, draw that such a conclusion, a deliberate man-made famine. Uh, I don't want to go too much into legal issues, and that's not uh, our field, but can you tell me something more about what you mean by starvation crimes? I mean, you have, of it course, you've been talking about it, but more specifically. There are specific actions prohibited um, under international humanitarian law and under international criminal law, the, the Rome Statute. And they fall into several categories. There is pillage, which is looting, massive looting. And we have seen that enormous amounts of the dismantling of, of infrastructure, of services, um, the looting of everything um, from cattle down to you know, chicks, from shops down to the little you know, kiosks used by shoeshine boys. Very, very comprehensive. There is destruction of objects indispensable for the survival of the population. This is the definition contained in the Rome Statute, um, which includes not just food, but also medicine and water. We're seeing water supplies being ripped up, the majority of the health services in, in, in the region vandalized or destroyed. There is the ethnic cleansing, which isn't a crime in itself. It is a composite of forced displacement and so on. So that the most fertile parts of Tigray have been taken over by forces from the neighboring Amhara region. These were areas that were contested, it's true, but, they, the, 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 the popular, but these were the areas that were feeding much of the rest of Tigray through migrant labor, through their surpluses, etc. They have been taken over. And then there are crimes against humanity, so that the widespread and systematic use of sexual violence was also a starvation crime because a survivor of rape, a woman who has been raped, particularly raped in the gruesome ways and cruel ways that we have seen in definitely in hundreds, probably in thousands of cases, a survivor of rape will probably not be able to care for herself and her children. And the fear of rape means that women and girls are fearful of going out, going to the shops, going to the market, going to collect foods from um, the forest, going about their everyday activities. So they are hiding. All this together comes under the rubric of starvation crimes, deliberate actions undertaken by military actors in order, in their own words, to crush. This is the word, the instruction given to the Eritrean units. You will crush Tigray. Alex. Theo, um, let me ask you, is, is, is Ethiopia too big to fail, as we, an expression that we used in the title of our roundtable? I mean, is the international community concerned that delegitimizing and weakening the AB federal government uh, might actually fuel more domestic uh, discontent, rebellions, and thus rock the boat, and, and also impact negatively on the entire uh, regional stability. Yeah, I, I think so. Although there's there's a contradiction uh, in that thinking. Of course, there's on the one hand, one sees that beyond Tigray, there is a very fragile, febrile situation. You know, 
Degre is, is, of course, in a category of its own, um, as Alex describes, but there's, uh, de you know, destabilization and tensions throughout Ethiopia. So, you know, you can take a one conclusion from that, which says, um, let's not rock the boat, in your words. Uh, the central government, the federal government, the prime minister are, are absolutely essential. And, um, and we need to do all that we can, you know, to try to, to, try to sort of bolster them or to give them breathing space. The contradiction there is if the actions of the federal government are the ones that, uh, you know, increase the destabilization. Things they do or things they fail to do are actually creating more destabilization. And um, there's, you know, there, there's by now a convincing pattern of, of action, which I would label as solving one, creating more problems in the pursuit of solving one problem. If you look at the approach of the federal government to Tigray, um, you tried to solve one problem, but it's multiplied incredibly. Uh, the tools and the actors that you enable in order to help you fight that war, just to give one example, uh, either from Eritrea, but also um, you know, domestically, uh, some of the groups neighboring Tigray have also been instrumentalized. Now, these have gone on to create knock-on effects for Ethiopia. Uh, the border war right now with Sudan is a direct consequence, uh, in some senses, of the free reign that's been giving to um, some, of, some of the Amhara. We could call it the Amhara political security complex in order to be more differentiated, who have been empowered by the space they've been given in Tigray, um, but they have land claims, as they do in Tigray, also in neighboring Sudan. And because um, I think the government in Ethiopia thought, hoped, was persuaded that Tigray would be a, a short shock and then over, uh, they've now been lured into a place of utter dependence. Uh, on the Eritrean armed forces and also on the Samara political security complex, which is again illustrating this point that in you know in trying to solve the one issue, the Tigray issue, you've actually multiplied and mushroomed the number of problems that you have. Thank you, Theo M Mutoni. Um, is there such thing as an Africa viewpoint on the Tigray crisis? Is there a way of looking at the crisis that is distinct from the approach that is prevailing in the West? Is there some kind of um, Western bias? I mean, my, the, the short answer would be there are probably as many African viewpoints on Tigray as there are Ethiopian ones. But if we're talking about sort of progressive African civic intellectual sector, um, Really, the concern that I'm hearing a lot is about the lack of a domestic grounding on which regional and other international action can coalesce. As we all know, civil society in Ethiopia is still extremely weak. Um, intellectuals who take different views than the sort of official line and the narrative are prone to sort of quite extreme um, tro trolling and sort of attacks on social media. Quite a few have left the country, either to neighboring countries or in the diaspora, other parts of the diaspora. Um, and so civic actors, as well as intellectuals, are proving to be as prone as political actors to the extreme kind of polarization that exists right now. I think there is some hope, though, with the domestic sort of human rights and women's organizations who have sort of begun raising their heads of Above the parapet and raising concern about human rights violations, IHL violations. Um, there's certainly some traction um, and some shock, including in the sort of Addis crowd, um, happened with the reports of sexual and gender-based violence that were released. I think there's also hope when we look at sort of the, the range of different actors, including state actors, political parties, the religious bodies, who are sort of beginning to coalesce under this uh, multi-stakeholder initiative for national dialogue, the MIME platform that's coming together under Destiny Ethiopia on the imperative for a national dialogue. 
Um, so much effort, I think, has been put into getting the sort of Western diplomatic community and actors behind the platform as the friends of the platform. Um, but African actors are also now focusing on building a contact group amongst the African diplomatic community to support the effort. Um, we all know that any intervention without that kind of domestic anchor um, is pretty hard to take, especially in a country where you know, everyone who's tried to get involved has been basically swatted away. Um, so that's from sort of the civic side and the sort of intellectual side. If we're talking about sort of African governmental and intergovernmental viewpoints, I think it's important to stress, although it may come across as this, this is not about a lack of concern for Tigray. Um, I think talking to government actors from the neighbors, from the AU, um, thoughtful people are really seeing Tigray in the context of what uh, Theo just spoke about, the much more generalized fragmentation in Ethiopia, whether you're talking about Amhara, Oromia, whether you're talking about Oromia itself, whether you're talking about Amhara, Benishangul Gumus, whether you're talking about Afar, Somalia, there is fragility in the country. And there's concern about placing this sort of the regionalized internal conflict in Tigray into context Many African transitions, as we know, come about less from the strength of opposition or protesting forces, but from the fracturing of ruling parties. And Ethiopia is really a case in point. We can revisit that later, but that fracturing that we see is not just at the political level or hasn't proven to be just at the political level and all of the former EPRDF's constituent parts. Where the EPRDF was sort of um, not linked tightly to the state, we're also talking about the intelligence and security apparatus, the civil service, even more so in Ethiopia as a federal state where all of these functions, including intelligence and security, were already devolved to the regions. So it's a very dicey situation. And that is sort of what is feeding into the calculations about sort of the approach. Um, because we can hammer on and on about sort of the human rights situation, the humanitarian situation, and of course we must do so because of the situation of people who live in Tigray um, and because of concerns about that. But I think talking to African interlocutors, their concern is sort of what are pathways out? Um, not just for Tigray, not just for Ethiopia, but given the growing tensions between Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, and all of their neighbors, uh, given Ethiopia's role as an anchor state and a sort of key peacekeeping contributor, both for the East African Standby Force, as well as various AU, UN missions around the region. So the African sort of governmental and intergovernmental posture is really trying to see now, how do we use the leverage created by not so much carrots anymore, but the sticks, to really push for dialogue, mediated or otherwise. Um, definitely there's coalescing around earlier calls for media, human rights, humanitarian access, and continuing to push on that. Um, definitely there's coalescing around sort of current calls for cessation of hostility, withdrawal of Eritrean forces, and political dialogue and non-military solutions, specifically with TPLF even though the government is extremely resistant to that. Um, and in that sense, I think African interlocutors really now see the European Union and US position, the new US posture, as sort of being the bad cops to enable the good cops to get to work. Um, but that's the concern is sort of what's a, what's a pathway out. When you talk about uh, the governmental level, uh, do you, also, are you also thinking of the African Union? Are there uh, positions, initiatives, divisions maybe within the African Union with regard to the crisis? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the neighbors as well as the AU and the AU at the political level. Obviously, the AU at sort of the bureaucratic commission level is compromised by sort of being present, being based in Addis. And we saw lots of evidence of that earlier in the year. But at the political level, um, you know, I think we can sort of, if you're, if you're wanting me to go into that, sort of looking at what the AU is doing, what position and sort of what posture it's had. I think there were different phases as well as different postures by, like I said, the political and bureaucratic arms. 
um, through the November to December period, there were many efforts to have the neighbors engage, Kenya, the Sudan, Uganda. There were three different African mediation initiatives, Hamdok of the Sudan in his own capacity, as well as through IGAD, um, Obasanjo of Nigeria, who you know was hammering on at the AU chair and eventually went in his own capacity without an AU mandate, but with an awareness and sort of tacit support from the AU chair, and then the three sort of AU envoys. As we all know, they were all rebuffed. The government line then was that it was still a law enforcement operation with specific goals, achievable in a short time frame. Um, but then we moved on to January and present, uh, January sort of to the present. And I think, you know, as I said before, it's clear everyone's predictions about this morphing into a protracted, regionalized armed conflict had come to pass. There were many more media reports and sort of independent human rights reports of gross and systemic human rights violations, as well as IHL violations, including from the public Ethiopian Human Rights Commission. There was much more clarity on the takeover of West Tigray by the Amhara administration, as well as the confirmation of Eritrean forces in country <clears throat> who were implicated in all of these above violations, as well as in the destruction of property and pillage that um, Alex just talked about. Um, and then, of course, there was a much stronger line coming from the American administration, the new American administration joining the EU line. So, you know, as the government began to make some concessions, however small but necessary, on media and humanitarian action. Um, there was that agreement to the joint sort of Ethiopia Human Rights Commission and Office of High Commission for Human Rights Investigation, as well as um, an authorized investigation by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And both of those investigative processes are now underway. Um, there was a sort of clever... <coughs> attempt to sort of, not even attempt, it succeeded. Um, when the Peace and Security Council met earlier this year, March, I think, uh, at the heads of state level, um, Ethiopia was put on the agenda, um, even though they had done everything possible to keep off the agenda of IGAD and off the agenda of the AU. Um, and a request was made for a sort of full report. Um, and definitely there's behind the scenes sort of engagement still by neighbors, um, as well as by Obasanjo, who continues his behind the scenes, sort of trying to broker or lay the ground for a dialogue that eventually has to come. Thank you, Mutoni. Uh, Theo, Mutoni touched upon the U.S. Uh, can you tell us something more about how uh, the U.S. Uh, reacted uh, to, the to the conflict and also um, the, the, the European Union, what kind of um, evolution in the, in the way the crisis has been perceived and in practical initiatives? Sure, let, let me start with the U.S. I think, you know, because Ethiopia is, is so important um, in and of itself, but also regionally and then globally, geopolitically, you can approach it from different lenses. Uh, there's a possibility to place Ethiopia within a China-US kind of Cold War proxy game uh, playing out in, in Africa. And that might have been a little bit more characteristic of the, of the Trump era approach. Um, and Ethiopia has, you know, has, has touch points on these different things. Can you still hear me okay? I'm getting an echo. I'm sorry? Can you yeah. hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, um, so one, one way it could have been approached was saying, look, it's terrible what's happening in Tigray, but uh, our, our bigger geopolitical priority as the U.S. right now is China, and Ethiopia is in a sense a frontline state there. But what we're seeing now coming out of the U.S. administration is very clearly prioritizing Tigray as, as a humanitarian crisis and making this the principal lens um, which shapes the rest of policy. That has implications for other parts of the U.S. government. Um, that means that where there are business or economic interests, where I think we're going to slowly see them being aligned behind this principal framing that the U.S. Special Envoy Feltman is, is bringing to it. So that's very important. I think we, we need to take note of, of that. 
the EU um, um, the EU has been ahead of its member states. It's been the first and the earliest to very clearly understand the gravity of what was going on. Um, and then it's also been the one that's sort of been the sharp end of the spear in terms of, you know, demonstrating more coercive pressure. What we haven't had or what we could see more of is a closing of ranks between the European member states and this, and this European Union lead. There's definitely a bit of there's room for, for some improvement there. Yeah, Th that was unusual, the lack of closing ranks. Very surprising. Um, Alex, uh, if you have reactions on the, uh, on, uh, on the broader responses by the international community, you're welcome to, um, to tell us. Uh, but there's a specific thing that I, I wanted to, uh, a more specific thing I'd, I'd like to ask you. Uh, are there past humanitarian crises that can teach us something about how the international community should react and what can, what can realistically uh, be done and uh, achieved? What are the tools and the options at our disposal? Well, one of the options that is still on the table, it hasn't properly, the cards pr haven't properly been played, is UN Security Council Resolution 2417, which was adopted three years ago, partly because um, humanitarian crises around the world, in Syria, in, in uh, Congo, in, in Yemen, etc., had over time generated enormous humanitarian consequences, including mass migration, which were... Um, also had major political ramifications. So 2417 was adopted with a couple of key provisions for the Secretary General or others to bring a crisis to the attention of the UN Security Council where armed conflict was threatening widespread food insecurity. And, it's, and, there, and, and it specified that... Um, um, the use of hunger could be a war crime, but it particularly specified the possible use of sanctions. And I think 2417 has not been invoked. It has not actually um, reached uh, the level of having a specific resolution on, on, on the case of Ethiopia, or specifically Tigray, because of the, 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 the impasse that we know at the Security Council. Also, the UN Secretary General has not been proactive on this, though the head of, of UN, OCHA, the, the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lecoq, has been quite outspoken. But I think we're, what we are seeing is the, the thinking behind it beginning to influence uh, key policies. And there are two points that I really want to make here. One is that the, the, um, the US agenda is very much for the unity of Ethiopia. What is, what, is, what is it that can be done to create the unity of Ethiopia? And um, actually, there's three points. The, the, the second point is that Eritrea is a major problem. Eritrea should withdraw. And the, the inability or the refusal of Eritrea to actually um, withdraw in any way, and, and the, the problem that Prime Minister Abiy has found himself in, which is that he is dependent upon Eritrea for pursuit of a military solution, is a problem that he has to be got out of by one means or another. And if he cannot be persuaded out of it, he has to be coerced or, or pressured out of it. And then the final point I want to make is where all this comes together is sanctions. The instrument of choice that will be utilized here uh, is sanctions, which is not generic sanctions, but individual targeted sanctions on those individuals who are seem to be um, obstructing the uh, the process of, of moving towards a political solution or obstructing humanitarian access. And Eritrea is in the firing line here. Eritrea has a lot of uh, less than licit commercial activities going on, which uh, are well known to the intelligence services, and they won't say anything. 
about whom they are targeting, which individuals, which companies, which real estate investments, which shady commercial activities. But you can be sure they are compiling the evidence on those and they will act. And I think this is something that um, Europe in general, including Italy, should be well aware of because um, the, 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 the tentacles of those uh, yeah, illicit uh, uh, commercial activities that are financing Eritrea and its war are, are going to come under a lot of scrutiny. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Muthoni, Alex uh, talked about an impasse within the UN Security Council. Uh, I was surprised when I read that uh, Kenya's position, uh, the position of Kenya in the UN Security Council, uh, was described as reluctant to put pressure on Ethiopia. Can you explain that? What is Kenya's position on the crisis? Well, I think there's always a public posture and a private posture. Um, and just to share a quotable quote from Kenya's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so, Abi began his law enforcement operation and it went the way all wars do, i.e. badly. Um, which I think is telling around how Kenya is actually seeing the situation. Kenya reached out to Ethiopia in the November, December period. It was rebuffed, but it was one of the key neighbors asking repeatedly the AU chair, the then AU chair, Cyril Ramaphosa, for urgent action, especially after Abi had apparently threatened to withdraw from IGAD if Hamdok persisted in trying to make Ethiopia the subject of an IGAD position. Since then, fast forward into this period, Kenya has hosted the Ethiopian president several times. It also hosted Abi on the guise of showing progress with the Lamu port and Ethiopia's birth there. The strategy really being to sort of gently urge away from this sort of military, this idea that there is a military solution to the situation and a reminder about sort of the region's economic potential. Um, Kenya is really trying to sell the idea of dialogue as a Kenyan contribution. And another quotable quote was, if Uhuru could talk to Raila after all of the sort of tension on the Kenyan political front, then surely Abi can talk to the TPLF. They really do see there is no way out of this except through political dialogue. And Kenya sees the EU and US posture as providing credible sticks to create the room for political dialogue. Um, to happen. Um, Kenya is also, I think, quite aware of how, you know, the use of sticks can backfire, have these unintended consequences. We all know in the wake of the um, American announcement of visa bans a week or so ago, how much anti-Western vitriol there was on Ethiopian social media, both in the diaspora and in countries with some demonstrations and protests. Um, and I think, again, coming back to sort of how Kenya is perceiving its maneuvers within this, um, is that international pressure alone, delinked from a sort of consistent domestic regional sort of process towards dialogue, can also harden positions in ultimately unhelpful ways. Um, we know already that the government of Ethiopia feels, you know, we can take this as it is, but this is the sort of sentiment, um, feels misrepresented, it feels under pressure, it feels that the concession, concessions it's made and its self-determined actions, um, e.g. on addressing the targeting of Tegaru, ordinary Tegaru, haven't been taken into account. So Kenya is trying to maintain its in with the government of Ethiopia, despite very real differences between Kenya and Ethiopia on a range of fronts, on the Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somali allowance, etc. Kenya just wants a sort of stable region in that sense. But what it doesn't want in terms of sort of, you know, the stick approach is, again, this, this focus on what is a sustainable pathway out. Um, and right now, it's political dialogue with Tigai. And it's also national dialogue on all of the underlying grievances and difference of, of opinion that have so affected this sort of tragic trajectory. Thank you, Muthoni. Uh, Theo, um, the three of you have mentioned Eritrea time and again. Uh, we know it's, it's, uh, it's been a key player. Can you explain 
um, to us what the role of Eritrea uh, has been, what the drivers and the interests behind its involvement in the Tigray war are? Sure. I, I think it's important to, to understand how, how Eritrea sees Tigray, because um, that's, that's animating its policy decisions, and it's also explaining why it isn't so easy to get Eritrea out. Um, there, there's a very long history between the Tigray region and its, uh, its political leadership, the TPLF, and Eritrea's president, Asaya Safawaki. Long, long story short, um, for Eritrea's president, this defeating the TPLF, it decapitating them as a political military body, is seen as almost an existential level interest for him. So once they have, once they committed to this war, um, it's even even more difficult for them to 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 leave the TPLF alone. They had a problem with them before the war, a very big one. But what they have now is entered into entered into combat with them with the stated objective of absolute victory. So anything they they've set themselves an incredibly high bar, and anything short of that is going to be. Um, very difficult for Eritrea's president to stomach, and probably will have some domestic repercussions as well within Eritrea. Um, we know it's it's you know a country that's famously under tight control, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't ripples of unrest here or there. It may just be a little bit less apparent to the outside eye, and and I think um, well, that's that's one aspect uh, that we need to keep an eye on. In terms of a sort of division of labor, um, I think what we have is the, the Ethiopian army lost a great deal of hardware at the beginning of the war with Tigray. Um, I think probably more than, than many people would realize. And again, long and short of that story is that the, the Ethiopian army on its own cannot keep fighting this war. So if the war goes on, it's in a, it's, it's in a place of dependency and relationship of dependency, both on domestic allies, I mentioned before, and, and very much on, on Eritrea. So if the Ethiopian government can't find a way out of this war, and if we also understand that the war will not be won militarily, it is, it's akin to a sort of Afghanistan for the Ethiopian government, except it's one that they can't walk away from. It is just slowly leeching away at Ethiopia's uh, wealth, international standing, and of course, with an incredible um, human cost. To change Eritrea's calculation is going to be very difficult. Um, there's, there's a sort of axiomatic truth in these foreign policy circles that pressure doesn't work on Ethiopia. But I would, I would push back on that axiom. Um, I think we can look at Eritrea when it was under United Nations sanctions some years ago and look at its level of activity in the region in that time, then compare it to more recently when it emerged from UN sanctions. And we can see that Eritrea's um, foreign policy activity, a lot of it negative, also mushroomed, it exploded. You know, so there is, there is some correlation there. Some of the other speakers have also mentioned that um, you know, there are pressure points to be found in Eritrea it takes a bit of digging. They're not so open and apparent, but they exist. Um, and I think, you know, it behooves policy to, to examine those quite closely. Thank you, thank you, Theo. This also answered one of the questions that we have um, received. Um, one question by Alessandro uh, from our audience. I, uh, it's, it's for Alex. Um, Alessandro asks, how much time is left to stabilize the conflict before um, we are actually in a situation of famine? You s somehow touched upon this, but if you could go back on the issue. I think we already are in a situation of famine. Um, the question is how long it will last and how, how far it will go. Uh, the planting season is upon us. Um, there's actually more plowing and planting than uh, was expected going on, uh, particularly in the areas controlled by the Tigray Defence Forces, where because the Eritreans have essentially been pushed back to the towns and the main roads in the last few weeks, allowing people, allowing farmers to plant. What they lack 
are um, the normally seeds are undistributed every year, so they lack seeds, they lack fertilizers. And if the plowing season does continue, then there is the possibility of a harvest later this year. If there isn't that, then the, then the crisis will continue uh, for a, a lot longer. The other driver is, is, of, of the crisis is the war. And what is a very, very tight sort of choke on, on humanitarian assistance that is imposed by, um, by the government of Ethiopia. This is entirely under its control um, through, through, the, uh, through the restrictions, the te terrorism designation, um, and, and, and so on. There are humanitarian operations can be conducted in war. We've seen that in, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere. The Ethiopians are not permitting that. So um, we are... We're really at a critical stage now where the situation will be destabil could either be stabilized at a famine, but perhaps an, only a famine confined to various areas, or it could get out of control and become a, a region-wide famine comparable to 1984-85. Thank you. Uh, another question from the audience, uh, possibly for Mutoni or um, for uh, Alex or uh, Theo, if you want to answer. The question is by Sarah. Uh, she asks, Ethiopia received massive amount of development aid in the past 30 years and was considered an extremely reliable partner by the international community. Uh, to what extent does the situation in Tigray uh, affect this relationship? Muthoni, do you want to comment on this? Well, yeah, I mean, Ethiopia together with Rwanda was one of the sort of poster child um, their children for sort of delivering on development outcomes. Um, and I think I said at the very start that, I mean, the part of the tragedy in Tikai is that, that those 25 years of investment in which universities were built, the health centers were built and so on have just been erased. Um, I don't speak for Western aid agencies, but I think, you know, it's clear over time that um, whatever cutbacks, whatever sort of um, holds, probably Theo is a better place to answer this, um, holds on sort of non-essential um, limitations to sort of just humanitarian aid. I mean, that's been coming slowly and steadily through the last seven months. Um, so yes, its status as sort of a recipient of, and a key recipient of American and European aid is, is affected. Um, but, you know, Ethiopia, like other African countries, also has choice, right? A lot of its infrastructure and developments are Chinese funded, funded by the Gulf, uh, and so on. So that instrument as a sort of means of pressure is not, you know, perhaps what it would have been way back when. Thank you, Matoni. Um, Alex and Theo, do you have anything to add on this? Do you want to add anything? I can come in briefly. Yes. Yeah, wants to follow. Um, you know, this question comes back to why why the the overarching policy framing is so important. That's why I mentioned that earlier. If if Ethiopia right now is seen principally through the prism of um, addressing the Tigray crisis and making all other international forms of engagement in Ethiopia from development commerce, and so on. If you make all of those subsidiary to that one goal, um, it puts a lot more policy tools at your disposal. To be concrete about this, um, if, you don't, if, you, if you don't take a, a, a holistic approach, you could see Ethiopia applying for debt relief under the G20 Debt Services Suspension Initiative on the one side. And then you could see development, uh, support, and assistance as something separate as well. And then finally, uh, what's going on in Tigray, the crisis as, as a kind of diplomatic foreign affairs issue. But if, if one of these becomes paramount, and this is what the US is doing, uh, then you go through a process of, of bringing these other engagements behind that singular objective. This is where the US is heading. Europe isn't there yet. Yet is maybe the operative word. Um, and I think this is the question that's going to be ahead of us now. Will, will Europe also, will Europe join the U.S. on that, on that track? 
will Europe try to find a role that complements um, the kind of approach that, that, the, that the U.S. is bringing? That's the things that we were being discussed right now. Thank you. Alex? I, I, I think that says it um, very nicely. Um, I, I think the, the, the U.S. analysis is that unless the Eritrean issue and the Tigray issue, which are so deeply entangled with each other, are addressed, the other, the other challenges of Ethiopia will, will, will not be addressed, uh, will not be soluble. And, and there's a clear US agenda for national dialogue broadly framed as a route towards resolving the, the broader question. It's very interesting, though, in the US statements, they don't mention the elections. They basically said these elections don't really matter. Um, what matters is looking at a, a, a broader national political settlement. Um, and, and there's a very also clear downgrading of the credibility of Prime Minister Abiy as a national leader going forward. People are clearly looking at um, him as, as, as damaged goods. The reform agenda is, is that, he, that he once manifested and espoused has... has, has, has Time's up. So this is uh, the fourth event on the horn that we've organized over the past uh, seven months. Um, most of our focus has been uh, on Ethiopia, uh, which is, of course, a crucial country. The stability and development of Ethiopia are critical to the stability and development of the horn. And both have been put at risk by the Tigray crisis, which is a very sad crisis that was uh, not unavoidable. So we shall continue our efforts to better understand and expose how events unfold. Um, thank you very much to our three panelists, Mutoni Wanyeki, Theodor Murphy, and Alex Deval. Uh, and thanks to all who followed the debate tonight. Have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>